Hey you, glad you could join me. I have had some curiosity questions uh, and some questions from other people about the forces, the loads, I guess, on the easy loader. And when we're putting on the stays and bolting them to the deck, what is actually required? Like what's actually going on with the easy loader in uh, terms of the amount of tension and compression and those types of things on the pivots, on the moments, on the attachment points from the easy loader to your deck, either of your truck or your trailer. So <clears throat> I thought it'd be fun. I brought out the little mini easy loader here. This is the one we use for displays. Yeah, a lot of fun. We would have brought this to displays this fall if uh, we, well, if there were conferences, but there weren't any conferences thanks to COVID. So next year, Hopefully we have conferences again, and uh, if, if we do and we can make it there, feel free to join us and uh, come play with it, take a look at it, a functional little model. Yeah, get the kids to play with it, lift up some of the little boxes, supers, that type of thing. But what we're interested in today is what is actually happening with our weights when it goes, when you're out uh, 16 feet, let's get this thing out to where it would be. There, let's say we stretch this thing out on our truck and trailer. So you've got 16 feet, you've got 300 kilograms at the end, and it wants to swing back in because I don't have it perfectly leveled. But what is going on? So just as a disclaimer, I am not an engineer. I am a beekeeper, a farmer, uh, and that type of thing. So I did ask some questions. I asked my brother, who is an aeronautics engineer, and we went over some of the numbers after some conversations. I sent him this as my main question drawing and he sent me back seven pages of notes and tensile strengths and formulas for me to look over and to discuss which nearly blew my brain up but did come up with some very interesting numbers so we'll go over that and I did actually confirm them with Mark to make sure that they are accurate to what they are doing and what they are seeing when they are manufacturing these things when they were engineered so we'll go over those numbers and again I'm not an engineer they are so their numbers are right but if I get them wrong it's totally possible blame me it's all good. Anyways, in this model here that we are having on display is modeled after the uh, rear mount models, the RM. So the 125 RM, the 200 RM, which are rear mounted models. The rear mounted models are going to be bolted to your deck at this level. This, this is the plate here. And they would have the stays underneath the deck attached to these three points here in a W format. And I'll toss in a photo of that. So on uh, the 300 MH, and I, I'm so high tech, I made myself a little cardboard cut out of the deck. The deck would actually be in this range here. So if that deck is there, right, then you can see that this post would be cut off just above the deck. This here, this post here would still run underneath your deck, right? So that'll be underneath the deck by about 18 inches total. And that is where we are attaching our stays to transfer that load, those, those tensions and compressions from the boom and from the mast to the deck of the trailer or the truck. Okay, so with the width of this unit, when we are bolting it to the deck of, of the truck or the trailer, we bolt it through the outsides. That extends the loads, the tensions and compressions across the trailer. It actually changes the moment or the pivot from the center point here. It kind of actually lowers it down to the wheel level of your trailer. So that actually becomes your moment, your tipping point, right? So it's not going to tip here at your deck. It's going to take the whole trailer over, which it will do. And that's because when we have this extended to you know, the full 16 feet and you've got 300 kilograms on here, the simple multiplication gives us 4,800 kilograms. That's what it is, that those, that's sort of the forces on it. So I'm gonna go over the numbers and see if, oh, hopefully I get them right. But when the loader is extended in this direction, on the back side here, you are going to have tension pulling this way, you'll have compression on this side pulling down. And the way it's explained to me in engineering is that this is, a, this is a moment, right? A pivot point, a moment. And every moment has to equal zero. So the compression on this side is around 5,760 kilograms. 
the tension on this side, 5,760 kilograms. So that balances out, right? But when we put our stays underneath here, what kind of compression and tension are on those? And if we go right to the bottom at that one and a half feet of the stays, and I'll put in a photo of the stays here that we mounted, but if you put those stays at the bottom, it changes that weight of 4,800 kilograms, it changes that into 3,200 kilograms of tension and compression, right? You've got both directions, tension and compression. So you have 3,200 kilograms tension and compression, and that's why ideally you want to have your stays going in both directions if you can. If you can't, you just need to make sure that you have enough the proper attachment there so that you're uh, dealing with that 3,200 kilograms of tension and compression. If you move up about six inches, it changes to 4,800 kilograms. You move up another six inches, you're looking at somewhere around 9,600 kilograms of tension and compression on those stays. So if you can move them low, move them low, right? That's, that's obviously taking strain off of that metal, and that's going to aid in making sure that you don't have cracks or breaks in your stays. The reason why that is critical in this direction more than it is in this direction is because this is 10 inches wide. Holding that entire weight, that entire tension is on that, on that 10 inches. So that's why those stays are there going both forwards and backwards. So that's in a nutshell why those stays have to be attached appropriately and as strongly as possible. On the outsides here, I'll swing that around. This right here, uh, with grade five bolts, you'll get away with it. Your grade five bolt has a tensile strength of, uh, I think it's about 120,000 PSI or uh, 120 KSI is how I think it works. Um, grade eight bolts are around 150,000 or 150 KSI. Mm -hmm. So grade five bolts will do it. Two, you have two grade five bolts out here with 120,000 KSI, 120,000 PSI um, tensile strength on either end. That's going to be lots for that. But being who I am, I always go with grade eight because grade eight is better, right? I don't know. That's how I do it. In any case, so that's the little fun facts there on tension and stress. When we look up at the triangle here, this triangle at the end here is around 2,400 kilograms, again, of that tension compression on these points. So depending on where it is in its swivel, you're either gonna have the, the tension, tension and compression, right? Or you swing it around the other, the other way, the tension and compression completely changes over. So it's important that this triangle is built well, and it is. Let me just see if I can get around to, be the, to the other side. Get a little closer up. This is constructed so that this round piece here of the pivot is made with 4140 steel. Uh, if you know your steels, uh, the, the higher up your number you're getting, I think, I think how it works is that it gets closer to spring steel. So this is designed with a certain amount of uh, spring, uh, spring and flexibility in it. This is still mild steel, these arms, these legs to the outside, okay? Those are mild steels. When you weld mild steel to 4140 high tensile steel, this 4140 has to be heated up appropriately so that these welds actually weld and stay together so that these welds have the same amount of tensile strength that is required for the 4140 and the um, uh, mild steel on the sides. These gussets on the side are cosmetic. They, it, 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 it appeared that these by themselves, without having something on the top, just had a bit of a, an appearance issue. So those gussets were added to be cosmetic, not structural. So when they are manufactured, they heat up the 4140 appropriately. They weld these on. It's actually a triple pass welding system. So they make three passes with the welds while it's heated up, okay? So that this becomes, th this meets the requirements for the engineered strength. These gussets, however, are welded on later on when it's cold. So you'll see sometimes that they crack. And you may have seen this on YouTube already, that sometimes these gussets are cracked. Those gussets, again, are cosmetic. So that cracking is there because they were cold welded to the 4140. That is not structural. That's not required. So these gussets can be completely ground off. So I was talking to Mark 
at Easy Loader not long ago, and he was saying that they were considering changing the process of welding those gussets on, not again because of the need for structural strength, but for cosmetics so that those cracks don't show up. My own personal thing is if there's a crack there being in Canada where we get water and ice if these are parked outside, I would be concerned about water getting into there, freezing in winter and causing more damage, rust or whatever, so it can shorten the life. So if I have a crack in one of those, I'm not sure I would be that concerned that I would weld it, but I might put caulking in it uh, just to make sure that it's, in, it's not getting water in it, right? Like take it inside, make sure it's dried out and then put caulking in it so that you're keeping water and ice out of those gussets. If you do want to weld them up, you, you can, you can, uh, obviously you can gladly do that, but then you just need to be aware of the two metals that you're using, again, the 4140 and the mild steel, so that you're not actually, uh, you can damage this by welding it incorrectly. So that's something that is, I think, required to know before you go ahead and do those repairs. One of the fun facts when we were doing some of these numbers is just wanting to know what the stresses were on that particular shaft in that spot. And that shaft, um, if you have a three inch shaft, I think it's around, it's around 19,000 uh, pounds is, is what it's doing, or 19,000 kilograms, pardon me, of, uh, of strain on that shaft. If it goes narrower, I think if you're going to, a, well, if you go to a four inch shaft, it drops down to 15,000. And if you go narrower, and I think uh, the bearings in there are actually 2.79 or something like that, which ends up being, if that shaft is about 2.79 inches, you're looking at around 21,000, 20,000 uh, kilograms of, of strain on that little shaft. So that's a, there's, a, there's a fair amount of, uh, engineering that goes into this to make sure that it is safe, that it meets the requirements for safety and use in, uh, in the bees for your safety and for that of your employees. So that's pretty neat. Again, this being mild steel and that type of thing, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the KSI on that is somewhere around 47 is what the shearing uh, um, stresses are here. And uh, mild steel to this, I think, is somewhere in the low 50s for KSI for shear strength. So it's, it's adequate for everything that is being done here. It's not only adequate, it's overdone for what is, ever, what is being required here. And I know talking to my brother when he was talking about engineering, he says generally in engineering, you always round up. So if 47 will do it, you go to 50. If 50 will do it, you go to 55 or 60. It's always, always up. So that's sort of the uh, long and short of some of the strains and stresses that are on here. And again, apologize that I'm not an engineer and I'm hoping that this is explained well enough that you can understand why our attachment points, why our stays are important, why I think this thing is very well built. So here. This is an easy loader made in Australia. Thanks for watching. Bye.